happy Monday, November 16th. The election is up. COVID is getting better. All righty, folks, we're just going to have to muscle through it. Don't waste a good recession, as they say. This week, we have news and more news. Simon's acquisition of Tubman is back on again. Suburban rents are outpacing urban. But more than that, we are now full swing into prediction season, my favorite time of year. What will 2021 be like? We're here to help you figure that out. We start with industrial today. We have a lot of smart professionals predicting things to come, talking about new developments, what their plans are. Good stuff in here. We also talk Milwaukee. There's a ton of surprising stuff going on in Wisconsin. Power 30 will be your guide to 2021. So let's roll the tape. Here are the week's big headlines. Interest rates can't get any lower. It seems to be the most popular phrase of the past 15 years. It is important. After all, interest rates on U.S. government treasuries are often the benchmark for fixed rate debt in commercial real estate. And to say rates are historically low is an understatement. Just how low are they? Well, last week's lows were 0.12% for the one-year rate and 0.78% for the 10-year. At the one-year rate, it would take 578 years to double your money. A $100 investment in a one-year bond would yield 12 cents after a year. Yeah, Brandy, that sounds patently ridiculous. The spread between interest rates on treasuries and real estate returns is at a high not seen in years. It has to be part of the reason investors seem to be indicating it's a good time to look at REITs. REIT prices are still down from pre-pandemic pricing, while other stocks in the market are above Q1 pricing. Can't give you investment advice, folks, but I can tell you when A is greater than B. I have to think real estate is being seen as a good hedge for the inevitable excuse me, inflation that will occur. The only reason rates are so low is that the U.S. government is printing money to buy its own debt. Yes, this is happening. It's normal, but it's happening at an alarming rate. This will undoubtedly deflate the dollar long term. And when the Fed is forced to allow inflation in order to pay off its mounting debt load, unwary investors will be hit with the double whammy. Your dollar has been devalued, followed by pricing going up. Real estate values can and should keep out ahead of these market forces. So go long, folks. Apartmentlist.com just released a report entitled The Suburban Rent Rebound, and we've seen conflicting reports on whether suburban rents are still being outpaced by urban or if the tide has turned in favor of suburban multifamily. Unfortunately for urban landlords, this report clearly shows that suburban's catch-up is more about a large drop in urban rents combined with only a modest increase in suburban rents. The pandemic's effects on everyday life have been more pronounced in urban neighborhoods compared with the suburbs. Business restrictions have closed a lot of the events and amenities that attract people to cities in the first place. We're talking live entertainment, bars and restaurants, public festivals. Many renters today are questioning whether it still makes sense to pay a premium for city living. As a result, migration plays a big factor in the urban and suburban rent divide. All eyes are now on the Biden administration to try and ascertain the impact on commercial real estate. So certainly another stimulus is necessary to prop up retail and Class B and C housing and to lessen the blow of the latest round of restrictions rolling back across the United States. But rising taxes and potential repeal of 1031 exchanges are making the industry nervous. Control of the Senate will likely dictate how these things change. Furthermore, a Democrat-controlled administration will almost certainly roll back restrictions and regulations on businesses, specifically housing, which Biden already stated he would do immediately. Okay, 2021 has to be better than 2020, right? Well, it appears CBRE is the first to publish 2021 predictions in its latest report. This 40-page report lets us start off prediction season here on Power 30. So CBRE covers just about everything from the economy and politics to hotels and data centers. And so will we over the next two and a half months. Today, we start with industrial. Todd's going to follow up with an interview with award-winning industrial developer Paul Hyde. The CBRE expects nearly 250 million square feet of net industrial absorption next year, which is nearly 20% above the trailing five-year average of 211 million. The year will be marked by low vacancy rates, record high rental rates, and robust development. Raising rents, however, are not hitting all markets just yet. 
we did have one tenant that tipped over. Uh, they did uh, kids shows. Uh, they were called V-Star, owned by Cirque du Soleil. They couldn't have shows. They, mm -hmm. they literally ran out of business. Mm -hmm. um, but what we've seen since then, as we're looking to backfill that space, we've got 10 prospects for that space from 50 to 100,000 feet. Yeah. I could build three more buildings at Stacks tomorrow and fill them. Oh. So we've gone from this sort of, oh my God, the sky is falling to now demand for new product. Very, very hard to find more sites, uh, especially ones that are big. Um, our belief is that uh, the market these days, it's a lot easier to compete with scale. Having multiple buildings in a park, there's lots of reasons for that, but you can accommodate all these different tenants uh, that may come through. And um, so we've looked hard for them. We've lost a Scanel on the deluxe site. Uh, we've seen some others that were just too expensive. And I think the barriers are, we haven't had a correction in the land price like we had in previous cycles. Um, and as far as you know, what we have planned next year, it's the same product type, same sites. Um, obviously things like last mile are getting more and more uh, popular amongst the online retailers, not just Amazon, but others too. Uh, but we've been seeing a lot of growth in the uh, build a suit for, you know, headquarters with office light manufacturing warehouse. We've seen DC requirements, uh, really almost everything across the board within the industrial sector. Looking forward to 2021. We, will are, we are actively out there looking for both that combination of infill industrial sites that we will go spec or potentially a build a suit if our timing works out right, as well as continuing to have strong land positions. The previous panel talked, I mean, we're working with the city of Rosemont uh, in the University of Minnesota for a property. Or for, we have a property of 170 acres that, you know, we are continually out there searching for those larger uh, requirements that just candidly don't have the physical space in the infill locations. So that's our, I mean, our strategy for 21 is to continue to accelerate all of the momentum that we see coming out of 20 in, in the industrial space. Obviously, much of the industrial demand will be e-commerce. CBRE research estimates that for every $1 billion of growth in e-commerce, 1.25 million square feet of additional industrial real estate is needed. So while 2021 may take a slight step back as people return to stores, it is still on track to push continued demand. CBRE also cites the growing popularity of retail to industrial conversions. We're going to have a power panel discussion on retail reuse in early December with some top names in the industry, so be sure to watch for that. Furthermore, the report indicates that inventory control will be another major factor in the expansion of industrial development and absorption. Many companies are using a China plus one strategy to diversify product sourcing and limit supply chain disruptions. Lastly, CBRE points to geographical markets that will benefit the most. Quote, Texas will provide the most opportunities for investors and occupiers with forecasted growth of 9% over the next five years. This is mainly gonna benefit Dallas, Fort Worth, but should also spill over to Houston, San Antonio, El Paso is also poised for growth as a benefit of its border location and near shoring opportunities. Industrial asking rents in El Paso are forecast to increase by 28.5% over the next five years, Todd. Over the weekend, Simon Property Group announced new terms to acquire Tubman Realty Group at a modified purchase price of $43 per share in cash. Simon will own an 80% stake in the Tubman Limited Partnership. The two were also tangled in litigation, which will be settled as a part of this new agreement. It wasn't immediately obvious if Simon's recent stock run had anything to do with this, go Simon, but it can't hurt when your stock jumps almost 30%. Hey folks, we had an event in Milwaukee showing that there is more going on in Wisconsin than just this guy. But first, folks, this week's episode is made possible by Munch Bunch Goat Rentals. Are you looking for a real weird way to get rid of invasive weeds? <laughs> Gosh darn it, shoot, look no further than the Munch Bunch Goat Rental. SR Mills, CEO of Bear Development. What is demand for real estate looking like? Demand side is, is directly impacted by what, what, kind of, you know, what kind of jobs, what kind of job centers. Um, and down in this area, Foxconn has brought the, the, the impact that we originally thought it was going to bring. But there's still a lot of good, lots of good things happening in Haribo. You know, you know, a lot of folks from Illinois, we're still being able to uh, coerce them to come north of the border here. And we're seeing that fill our industrial parks, distribution, warehouses is, is, has been a massive influx. Um, and what that's done is that that is uh, really pushed uh, the need for housing in all sectors and in all types. Um, from you know workforce housing up to high-end estate 
estate single family lots. So we're, we're continuing to see that big impact. And Industrial is strong in Milwaukee. It could be described as a supporting hub for Chicago, but that would be an oversight. There's more to Milwaukee than that. It has a diverse base of office, retail, hotels, and a unique urban culture of its own. It sits on a beautiful part of Lake Michigan that attracts tourism from all over the country. Milwaukee is clearly transforming into a city that can stand on its own two legs from a commercial real estate perspective. Um, in Milwaukee itself, we are doing a, a, a project in Walker's Point, which in itself is a transforming neighborhood. And this is a piece of that transforming neighborhood. So we're taking an old uh, 100,000 square foot building, restoring it into an innovation hub um and kind of creative office space and you know and that's going to be really bringing some of the jobs and some of the activity and safety and kind of bringing some of the historic fabric and re reinvigorating that historic fabric fabric into uh walker's point area and then also with that bringing some of the technology innovation big businesses under one roof iris singer what kind of transformation are you seeing in milwaukee Transformation is uh, in existing buildings also. That's uh, one of the great things about, you know, design, build, construction is it allows for an existing asset to change its personality. Uh, an office building doesn't change too much, but uh, one of the transformative properties that uh, we're proud to be affiliated with is uh, the Novel co-working office building in downtown. Uh, Novel is out of Chicago and we are uh, working on some of their assets there, but they're a national company. And they have spent most of their asset uh, acquisition in major markets. And so to look at Milwaukee and see an existing building that transforms uh, into micro offices, which is their business model, which is transformative in that it supports the small business owner. That's its target market. It supports the entrepreneurs and tech while the design in the buildings is, is great. It's got terrific energy and it's, uh, you know, it's something that they have successfully replicated. And when you see a building like that in Milwaukee, I think that is speaking, uh, it's putting a stake in the ground for the small business sector and big cities are built on small businesses. So I think that is also a very transformative uh, project. There's definitely a lot going on in Milwaukee. If you haven't seen it, get there. To, well, Culver will be over soon. Get to Milwaukee. Check it out. A lot going on. Paul Hyde, High Development. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a pleasure to have you. I um I, I have to admit, uh, the Northern Stacks in, in Fridley, it's an amazing project. I toured that when it was the, was it BAE? Am I saying that right? Oh, sure. Yes. And it, it was awful, right? It was a, uh, a brownfield disaster. The buildings were, um, I remember, uh, who was the broker on that deal? Um, Mark Colesrude. Colesrude. Col so Colesrude gets us in the cart. It was so gigantic. You had to ride in a cart just to see the building. The and, Austin and Powers cart. <laughs> it, it was. It totally was Austin. I didn't even think that he should have had an Austin Powers outfit on. Colesrude, <laughs> if you're watching this, you, you blew a chance. <laughs> but as you drive down the middle, you look to the sides and, and there's these heavy manufacturing hooks, right? Down the middle. And so all of these buildings are built in that old style and, and the, with the hook down, going down the middle. And I remember staring at that saying, well, there's walls here and there's a ceiling here and there's a concrete floor, but what in the world are you going to use this for? And then when you get to the end of the building, there's a, another building with a 70 foot ceiling, right? So, so you've done a lot of uh, Brownfields development and you took on this project. What did you see when you looked at that and thought I can make this something? Um, at first I saw a lot of the same things you saw, which freaked me out a little bit. Um, our strength is being able to see through that and try and see what the future potential could be. And this was 2012, 2011, 12. So the world had ended and we were all watching CNBC and going to happy hour at noon. And I said, you know, we might as well roll up my sleeves and dig into this thing. Um, we had done more redevelopment of Superfund sites than anybody. This was our fourth Superfund site that we'd redeveloped. And the more we dug into it, um, the more potential we saw to be able to clean up the site, 
consolidate the BAE technology folks into a smaller part of the building, which is 500,000 feet, tear down the other million and a half feet, and then put up new buildings. And once we saw that kind of vision and laid out the site plan, then it was just two years of kind of blocking and tackling to execute on the environmental, the city approvals, the development, the construction, the leasing, uh, and the financing. If I remember right, the environmental wasn't complete though. There were a lot of um, plastic pipes coming out of the ground on a lot of that land. And then there's some railroad tracks kind of awkwardly coming in. Yep. A lot of hurdles. A lot of hurdles. A uh, big groundwater extraction system uh, run by the Navy that is actually being improved right now as we speak. Um, but because the old building had covered a lot of this residual pollution, no one had ever been able to get at it and dig it up. And that was one of the major things we were able to do is convince uh, EPA, PCA, the Navy, uh, BAE, that, hey, uh, you're going to have a real window here when we tear the floor off to go get, get, get at this stuff, dig it out like a cavity. And that'll really uh, address kind of the last of the source product in the soils. And you're going to have to go fast because we're going to have a building over it quick. So get on your bike and go. And we were able to do that. And we got a lot more cleanup done. They were able to do it a lot more efficiently than trying to work around the existing building. And it ended up being one of the neat, you know, kind of success stories on the environmental side uh, related to that project. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I have never heard it compared to dental work. Uh, <laughs> it's I, not which, similar. <laughs> I don't know if you're a hockey player. I am, and I've had plenty of dental work done. Um, but <laughs> But uh, there you go. Yep. Pull it out like a cavity. Let's go. Dig in there. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. So that project now, tell me about it now. I haven't driven by there. I, I drove by John Allen's site um, on the other side of the highway when he won the Lifetime Achievement Award. I went over to Colzer and looked around. Um, that's new product, like brand new product around there. Uh, so everything you're doing is new. Tell me about some of the new tenants and the things you built. Yes, yeah, so we've probably got 2 million feet of development on the site. Um, what's so neat is that's now spread amongst 15 or 20 tenants, which makes it a lot more diverse uh, industrial park than just one tenant. And that's what had been happening to these cities. The one company goes bankrupt or moves out of state and it leaves these abandoned sites with pollution, terrible buildings, but a loss of tax space and a loss of jobs. So. It worked for the market, it worked for our development, but it also was a great result for the city to get a diverse stock portfolio of tenants. We've got Horaeus Medical in there. We've got Resolution Medical. We've got Trio Supply that distributes paper products to restaurants and schools. Um, we have uh, LKQ that is an automotive parts distribution center. Uh, Tiss and Krupp, elevators and escalators. Intertech, a testing company. So a wide variety of uses from distribution to uh, manufacturing to medical that uh, populate the park. So what are the medical people doing there? Uh, Horaeus is an R&D facility, oh. uh, doing medical R&D for one of the largest medical companies in the world. And then Resolution Medical is a contract manufacturer. They'll do contract manufacturing of some small prototypes before it goes into big uh, production. And they're just growing like crazy. Well, I remember you pretty much had a clean sweep at the Minnesota Real Estate Journal Awards with that project and Executive of the Year. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, that's a hard fought battle every year. I, I, we can't ever hear what the judges say or they're thinking, huh. um, but I got But there's always good people up for Executive of the Year. So that's pretty cool. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But So the medical sites, they're pretty close to, to uh, Medtronic. Is that sort of a feeder? So would you consider again looking at that corridor along 694 is potential medical R&D places? It's a, that's an excellent question. And uh, I was at the brewery, uh, Forgotten Star Brewery yesterday at Northern Stacks, talking to some of the Resolution medical folks, uh, socially distanced, of course. And uh, they said that they Googled uh, that today, like number one destination in Minnesota to land your medical company, it was Stacks. Really? Yeah, Congrats. It's because we have two of them, and it's also the proximity of Medtronic. Um, 
and, and it's access to that, that workforce that really is, is critical for them. So uh, absolutely, we'd look to do more of that in the park. So I would have not thought you said, when you said access to, to the people, um, and for the people on the show that are listening to a national show, I'm sorry, but we're talking Northern Minneapolis, St. Paul metropolitan. It's not the posh suburb that the Southern and Western areas are. Uh, this is blue collar town. So really the, the that's where your the, the potential staff are. Yeah. And we, um, we spent a great deal of effort in branding the park and putting amenities in the park to overcome that initial hurdle. When we started, mm -hmm. that was the stigma. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's in Fridley. Um, it's sort of a third or fourth place community to locate your business, kind of sleepy, the other side of the river. And we worked really hard to try and um, disabuse people of that notion. And what we did is we said, well, we're really across the street from Northeast Minneapolis which is a super cool growing yeah. part of our community. We're 10 minutes from downtown. We've got quick access to the interstate to get to the airport. And we're minutes from uh, where the executives live, Maple Grove, Plymouth, um, even Edina. And the transportation system can get people to our park uh, more efficiently than some of these outer ring locations. So that, that was the first building block, the marketing, then it was the access. And then the third piece is we've worked really hard at creating a sense of community there. We're trying to make it a neighborhood. And we've got a program we do with the Music Ant Group where we've um, got weekly newsletters, uh, pre-COVID, all sorts of activities, uh, pumpkin smashing contests, uh, different clubs, running clubs, exercise clubs, book clubs. We're gonna have uh, a uh, recipe contest to produce uh, Northern Stacks cookbook kind of for the holidays. Um, and then the, the fact that we've got a trail system in the brewery there really helps it create a community. And you know, I was there last night and there's these tenants and there's these tenants and they all know each other now. And it's really unique uh, because it's less like working in a box in a cornfield and more like working in a neighborhood. And I think that's gonna be this part of the future of industrial development is creating that sense of community and giving people a place to go during lunch and activities after work and more people to meet. I would not have thought of that 20 years ago when you said industrial, we, because you're thinking rail spur, um, yep. you know, you're thinking grungy, uh, you know, gritty stuff. And now you've got medical, you, you've got people there doing medical device companies. That's different than your typical, um, you know, just a, a distribution area. Well, congratulations. What a fantastic idea. What inspired you to, to build this out to be higher end than just a simple industrial park? Um, I was tired of seeing buildings that were tan and brown. And one day I wore orange pants to a meeting and the architect said, we're gonna put orange on the building and everybody laughed. And then the broker said, we can't lease it. Uh, it needs to be brown. I said, well, we're going to try. Uh, we can always paint it. And I think the color scheme sort of said this was different. And then the fact that it was an infill site, um, we looked at that as something that might never be seen again and wanted to create an opportunity for diverse sets of businesses to see themselves there. And so Horea said, this building looks like it would be in Prague, Germany. And the trio guys said, it's really close to our old location. Uh, so everybody found something different they liked about it. We even had a tenant that picked it because he, uh, we had miles of walking paths and he liked walking during lunch to kind of think about what was going on. So that was what inspired us, trying to make it something that could apply to a broad group of people and not just a box. Well, the river is nicer than people give it credit for. I think if you had walked out of BAA's facility towards the south and gone like this and not looked at the railroad and looked at that river development, that was nice. So that was that gave you a leg up, I bet, Tep. Just, I just think a lot of people overlooked that value because of the neighborhood it was in. Yeah, I agree. Are, are you using the rail at all? Are any of those tenants bringing in stuff on rail? 
Yeah, um, for the first time, we've got a tenant in our Stacks 8 building that's a paper uh, company, one of the second biggest company in the world, Lindenmeyer Monroe. And they've activated the rail spur. It's a cost effective way to move paper. And to them, every nickel matters. So we're absolutely using that uh, rail service in the Stacks 8 building. I think my, and I don't know if you know this, I, I do the background stuff for, for our awards program in Houston, Chicago, Minneapolis. And oh, so wow. I'm the only one that gets to see what's going on behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I drew the short straw on that, but it's so fun as a, as a real estate. I'm, I'm passionate about projects. And so I love to dig in and, and learn these things. So it's fun to see that, but, but I, I'm hoping that there's more Paul Hyde in the future. There's that we get to give you more awards. What do you <laughs> foresee for a high development? What's next? Uh, we'd love to find another um, big redevelopment site. Um, is it Minnesota? Are you, are you okay going out of? Yep. Um, so we're, we're working on some in Minnesota right now uh, that hopefully we have more to talk about soon. Um, we've got uh, three projects in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, and we're now heavily investing with our partner Mortensen in Denver. Uh, we have a big million five square foot park called 76 Commerce Center, uh, which I'll talk about on tomorrow's panel. Uh, that's three quarters of the way done. And we're investing in a 400 acre park right by DIA, DIA and the Gaylord Hotel called High Point. Uh, and that could be 5 million feet or so, you know, five times the size of stacks. And wow. One of the reasons that's happening in Denver is um, we make money on the difference between what we spend and, and what we charge in rent. And uh, rents haven't risen, costs have gone up, land prices aren't falling, and sale prices aren't getting any better. So there's just, there's kind of a break even point that we're stuck at. And what we need is a, a new sale to set a new sale price record to break some new barriers on cap rates that can justify some new construction. I'm hopeful that the Prologis portfolio that's on the market now for two and a half million feet when that trades next year does that for us. And then I think you'll see a new round of projects uh, in Minneapolis. But that's what's been happening in Denver. Cap rates keep compressing and compressing and compressing. So you're still able to do projects there. Well, well this is great. Thank well, you. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you get more awards and seeing you at the industrial event tomorrow. We'll do that. See you later. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks for your time. Bye. Yeah, for sure. Bye.